welcome everybody. I know some people are still uh, coming into the room, um, but let us get started and uh, on pretty much on the dot as we normally do uh, here in Denmark. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce this event, the Belt and Road Initiative and New Regionalism. I'm Duncan McCargo. I'm the director of the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies here in Copenhagen, also a professor of political science at the University of Copenhagen. And I'm very excited to be introducing our first event. All our events are online events these days. So I should also say our first online event of 2021, which is uh, a collaboration between NIAS and the Food and Center that we host here uh, at the University of Copenhagen. Um, it's really a great pleasure and privilege to have a very distinguished group of speakers. We're focusing particularly on a new book that has just been published, of which um, title, the exact title is slightly different from the title of the talk because the exact title of the book is the Belt and Road Initiative as Epochal Regionalization. And we're very fortunate to have with us one of the main authors of that book, Professor Cheng Jingming, who is a distinguished professor at Trinity College in Connecticut in the United States. Uh, he's a great friend of Fudan University and one of ours, and we're really pleased to have a chance to welcome him uh, on this occasion. I know that he's done a lot of work about global cities and bending borders and these other kinds of phenomenon um, that are now very salient in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative, a subject of great interest to people here in Europe, but also in my own area of specialism in Southeast Asia. And I know there is a, a Lao case study in this book, which I look forward to reading because this initiative looms very large uh, in the imaginations and the realities of many people uh, in the Mekong region in particular. Uh, so it's great to have um, Professor Chen Jingmen here. Uh, also an another speaker who's joining us. It's always a great pleasure to welcome one of my distinguished predecessors as NIAS director, Jörn Delman who really is responsible for setting up a lot of things that made NIAS what it is today. He's currently Professor of Chinese Studies uh, here at the University of Copenhagen and has been working a great deal in all sorts of policy related areas on China and, and to a large extent on the Belt and Road Initiative in recent years. So it's wonderful to have Jörn here to speak as well on this topic. And discussing, commenting on the papers. Once we've had the presentations, uh, we will be privileged to hear from Hans-Jörn Gazimir, who is both at NUPI um, in Oslo, the International Affairs Institute, and also at the University of Bergen. He's another old friend of ours, was here last, I think, in Copenhagen when we launched our book about Nordic-China relations at the end of 2019. So, these are people that we used to see in the good old days more when we could actually go out and see people, but we were delighted to be able to maintain these active uh, connections and collaborations, especially with our NNC partners uh, in Norway, who are very important to us. Okay, so it's a fantastic group of people that we have here, and I look forward to some very interesting presentations and discussions. And with that, I will hand matters over to um, Chung Wong Liu, my distinguished colleague who is the uh, executive director of the Food and Center, who will say a few words and then moderate the presentations and discussion that follows. Thank you, Chun Rong. Well, thank you, um, um, uh, Professor Makago, for your very, very nice welcoming remarks. Good afternoon from Copenhagen. Um, my name is Chun Liu. I'm uh, working at uh, Food and Center and NIES at the University of Copenhagen. I'd like to join uh, Professor Makako to welcome all of uh, our speakers and all the participants in the Zoom. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so Belt and Road Initiative uh, continue to be one of the most uh, debated topic in both media and scholarly work on China. So um, beyond uh, those familiar uh, headlines, which tends to uh, uh, focus on this geopolitical dimensions. Um, I think there are still many nuances and complexities to be investigated. For instance, uh, how Belt and Road Initiative projects are organized and um, operated on the ground. What forces, um, and what uh, actors, dynamics, 
uh, uh, have been playing out in different regions and policy domains. Uh, with so many um, corridors and regional hubs and bilateral <coughs> projects, how can we uh, re-image BRI as a driving force of globalization, new globalization? So on top of that, the uh, COVID pandemic has greatly slowed down and, and skated down um, um, cross-border mobilities, but it has also generated uh, new dynamics, new demands, and new priorities for international cooperation, not least in digital uh, connectivity and health and sustainable, uh, sustainability uh, infrastructure, etc. So whether and how these um, challenges and opportunities uh, can combine together and shape uh, the new uh, pattern of uh, regional development and regional architecture. So that uh, uh, would really invite a serious and uh, thorough discussion. I believe we can have, a, as Duncan um, said just now, we can learn a lot of insights from our distinguished panelists uh, this afternoon. So um, after conversations and presentations um, with the panelists, I think we, we shall have around hopefully 20 to 30 minutes for open discussion. So please feel free to raise your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to communicate them to our panelists for a um, uh, informed discussion. So with that, uh, Professor Chen, um, the screen is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, let me bring out uh, Can you all see the screen, I assume? Well, let me begin by uh, saying good afternoon uh, to all of you over there and thank uh, Turnrong, Duncan and Jurgen and also Hans uh, to, to be with me uh, on this very um, timely um, discussion on the Bell Road. And I certainly want to acknowledge all the uh, institutions that are hosting uh, today's webinar. Um, so let me begin by just uh, give you a very brief introduction to, to the book and also want to acknowledge uh, my two collaborators. One is based in Fudan, one is in Australia, uh, who work on other aspects um, of, the, uh, of this particular project on uh, the regional dimensions of the Belt and Road. But the book is... Uh, uh, it's my sort of responsibility, and it's a relatively short book. It has uh, five chapters, and so far, these chapters have been published in a journal format, uh, in a serial journal format, and the book should be, uh, the formal book uh, should be out uh, available uh, now or very soon. And given the time limit, I will focus or limit the presentation to just the introduction chapter and the uh, second chapter. And even though, um, I, as Duncan alluded to, uh, I do have a chapter on, on China, Southeast Asia, but I won't um, talk about today, but I would like to suddenly uh, um, engage him on discussion at some other time, but I might make reference to it. Um, so let me begin also just to uh, give um, the audience a very quick orientation sort of to the framework. Um, and so I kind of reconceptualize uh, the Belt Road, uh, as Chun Rong alluded to, by really focusing on this set of a growth or economic corridors of different shapes, length, density, width, uh, and also impacts at a variety of geographic scales. I, I think general audience are sort of, a, when they see the map, they see these corridors, right? They all kind of extend from China uh, out in different directions. Um, but I, my main argument for the book is to um, posit that as these growth corridors take shape, as they begin to spill out the influences locally, regionally, and globally, they're beginning to shape or reshape three master processes of globalization, urbanization, and development. So in this book, I 
use three different case studies and use uh, China, Europe freight train or containerized cargo train to talk about how the Belt Road affects globalization, production, networks, logistics, by looking at through a new set of transborder connectivities through logistics networks. And then of course, two other chapters deal with how the Bell Road is allowing China to build out, to extend its footprint on building urban construction, urban infrastructure, both embedded locally and connectively across cities in Southeast Asia. And then of course, the last empirical case chapters on Africa, where I look at the Addis Ababa to Djibouti development corridor. So three different corridors, three different geographic regions, but with a common shared theme of looking at real connections, special economic zones, and also urban redevelopment, okay? So, so this is the familiar map. So basically uh, in this book, I focus primarily on growth corridor one and three and four. And the last chapter on Africa takes the analysis beyond the overland corridors to Djibouti, which is at this mouth of the Red Sea. And so growth corridors are nothing really new. I mean, they did not just come about because the Belt Road was down. So let me just give you a very brief introduction to three older cases. On the left of that, you see, you should be familiar with a Euro-American audience. This is the Northeast corridor of the United States, obviously with New York highlighted at the center. So this is the oldest megalopolis uh, of the US and one of the earliest elongated, highly urbanized, highly densified uh, corridors that are linked and anchored by cities of Boston to the north and Washington DC to the south with New York and Philly in the middle. And you see this very small pink circle, that's Hartford, Connecticut, capital city of the small state neighboring New York. That's where I work, Trinity College is located What's in the center is an East Asian case. Sometimes it's abbreviated as Besetto. So you have Beijing, Seoul, and Tokyo. This came about uh, from a South Korean geographer in the 1970s. It wasn't really broadly uh, researched, and, but I think it's a good reference point because the corridor extends and across both land and sea. But again, it's really anchored by major international urban centers, okay? So you see it uh, stretching going uh, east and west. And of course on the right, it should be more familiar or most familiar to a European audience. This is obviously known uh, is the Blue Banana Corridor, right? This is a, a French geographer, Roger Brunet, in 1989, came up with this descriptive geography of this long, highly urbanized, highly connected corridor stretching somewhere near Manchester, Liverpool, the border between England and Scotland, and going down south across the Benelux states, and it was the end somewhere around Milan in northern Italy or terrain. There are other variations of this that would uh, uh, argue that it's actually in somewhere around the uh, Spain, Barcelona East Coast. But anyway, you can see this region again is very highly densified as the small map indicates. Now, a quick summary of these earlier corridors, right? So they obviously vary tremendously in length and width with blurred and porous boundaries. Again, they are highly urbanized, highly popu high population density, but they share this common feature. They are largely market or informally uh, developed from the bottom up. 
we hardly in any formal state planning or little interstate translocal coordination. So it's a market driven, business oriented, um, urban development, suburban development, uh, connections by commuting patterns and, and, and long distance intercity uh, rails. Again, they're anchored and passed through by major international cities uh, centers. And their hinterlands, very well social, economically connected hinterlands, known in different terms in different countries, or suburbs, exurbs, uh, small satellite cities, but generally they are located in uh, advanced economies. And there's a relatively small number of what uh, Brunei called inactive spaces or passive spaces. The gaps are small and very little uh, inequality. But now if you look at the PR corridors, they're really quite different, right? The distance often are longer. They cover longer geographic distance, wider scopes, there are much larger gaps or uh, inactive spaces. And also some of these corridors go through very challenging terrain. You know, the ones that go through into Central Asia, China, Pakistan economic corridor, they go through uh, high snowy mountains. Um, and again, you know, the boundaries are, are not very clear. But if you take these six corridors and the sub corridors that affiliated with them or extend out from the main corridors, they really add up to a very large geographic scale of global regionalization with very uneven regional and local impacts. Why? Right, for these following reasons. Obviously, they, these all initiated from China, anchored to different Chinese cities, and, and often originated or passed through remote inland border regions with cities that are much smaller or weaker compared to the East Coast cities. And they cover a large variety of less developed countries. I mentioned Southeast Asia, Africa, obvious, right? But even going through Central Asia, you have the former Soviet uh, uh, states that are in many ways are very similar to the global south in terms of urban development. Very small number of large cities, large vast geographic territories, right? Very low population density and heavy dependence on natural resources such as energy and other commodities. And then you have also within and near these corridors, you have many marginalized or edges of these small scale cities with low density and again, difficult access. The summary point, also very important geographic point is that all of these corridors are largely overland, but they have connections to countries that are landlocked and potentially could open them up to access. You see, and I'll illustrate that. And this is sort of an updated chart from a recent article and I really want, and it's more complicated, I can take you know, a lot of time to talk about, it, but I want to highlight three things. I really wanted to, you to identify or thinking about how these four different zones are connected. Obviously they're connected from the point of view of timing and the sequence of China's reform and opening. Originating obviously from Shenzhen, and then extending north along the coast, right? Around 2000, and what I call when China made the second geographic turn to the interior, to the west. The first turn 1980 to the east of the sea, the second one to return to the land to the west. And I highlight the central region of China, mostly Xi'an and Wuhan, because these are two very important cities that are destinations and origins of the China-Europe freight train. I'll focus on Xi'an, where I have done most of the work for this book. But then if you go further west, right, geographically contiguous or adjacent, and then you see three sub-regions of Asia that circled around the western borderlands and southwestern borderlands of China, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and obviously South Asia, CPAC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and obviously the Indian um, the subcontinent. And of course, uh, in this chapter, I stretch the interzone connection all the way to the Western 
and uh, where you probably find uh, Europe, and of course, West Asia, the Middle East, and also, of course, uh, uh, Africa. So the differences between each of these zones are highlighted at the bottom of the table. And so there are different mechanisms of connectivities from zone one to zone two to three and four that I'll illustrate. And this is obviously a, a very good, um, I think a fairly uh, authoritative map of the China Europe cargo train. And again, I highlight Xi'an in the center here, but I'll make brief reference to Wuhan, not only because it's the epicenter of the pandemic, and I think Duncan made references to, uh, I think Turner made references to, obviously the PPE, right, are now shipped over then by these trains uh, to Europe. And of course, there are, are very spur lines, you know, or uh, less important secondary lines that spin off from the main lines. But the main lines, obviously, is this brown thick line in the middle. Obviously, if you can trace it back to the original Eurasia uh, land bridge that connects Lianyunbang in Jiangsu and Amsterdam in the Netherlands, but you know, this started in the 90s, but it hasn't been very active until about 10 years ago, when Chongqing launched the very first train from Chongqing to Duisburg in Germany on the Rhine. And then, you know, it started this very rapid, accelerated growth, the China-Europe train trains. You can see a small number in, at the beginning, a couple of years before the official launch of the Bell Road. Of course, when we look at the Bell Road now, a lot of these things that have happened before the Belt Road have been retroactively linked to the Belt Road. But then you see the last three, four years, you have very rapid increase in the total number of the trains. Of course, now I've just got the complete data for 2020. We have 12,400 total number of trains running in both directions, westbound going to Europe and eastbound coming back to China through Central Asia. And this is another very important chart to show, right? At the very beginning, for quite a few years, it's very asymmetrical. A lot more trains going to Europe, empty containers coming back, right? But a considerable loss, you know, to the sort of the actors, stakeholders involved. But in the last couple of years, the China bound trains, the return trains have began to catch up relative to the much larger number of trains that started going west. So 2019, you think you have a fairly close uh, balance between the directions, okay? And then again, when you look in China from the eastern end of this transcontinental rural connection, again, you see the re-emergence of the Asian city of Xi'an, the old eastern end of the Asian Silk Road, right? Given this geometric center location of China, it has become one of the top sending cities for trains to Europe. And then you, it draws a number of other cities into its known network. Then if you look at this middle graded area of China, this is interesting. It's different from the traditional eastern, central, western division. Right, because and also it goes beyond what now people talk about. It's the Yangtze River Economic Belt, right? It brings a number of central and western regions into a new kind of regional formation that are linked to these growing number of rail lines. Again, the eastern cities that developed first, my zone one cities, now have rejoined and have returned west into the central part of the, the region. Of course, the four small border cities where the trains leave and return into China, the exit and entry points, obviously are Hogos, Alashanko, and of course, Manjoli and Arin Halta in Mongolia. Now, if you look at Xi'an's role in drawing trains, right? So I've identified four other cities in neighboring and also coastal provinces, right? The one in the center, it's region is from, Xi, from Xiamen, a Fujian province, lots of uh, manufacturing, electronics, shoes, consumer products that were originally made by Taiwanese invested companies. And now they're sending a train to Xi'an, reconsolidated, 
and then leave for Europe, and then the Hubei, other provinces that are involved as well. And again, here's another map just to show it's not just from Xi'an going to Europe, and also Xi'an also beginning to connect to South Asia, right? Obviously through, this is not just the trains, but it's intermodal, multimodal transportation, trains to the border, and then you have also trucks going through Kunjara uh, Rap. And this is, you know, 5,000 meters above sea level, going through Kashgar uh, into Pakistan and uh, Islamabad, and also the trains are planned to go to Nepal through, uh, through Tibet. I've done a little bit of field research in the Konjara Rap, in, in the border between China and Pakistan. So it's, they're planning for it. And so this is a sort of ambitious efforts to really connect the interior central cities and the far secondary tertiary centers in the remote regions of neighboring countries. And this is an interesting example of how Xi'an is connected to Europe by focusing on shipping a particular product. In this case, the Volvo cars, the XC60, that's made in China in Chengdu and also in Daqing, right? Now are sending, uh, are being sent to Europe uh, in this block train, right? Different, two different ways of shipping it inside a container and the roll on, roll off uh, uh, racks. Uh, like the one in the upper left. Of course, in return, Volvo sends the XC90, a more expensive luxury sport utilities that the rising middle-income uh, consumers China can afford to buy and they're shipped back to the interior cities of Chongqing, Chengdu, Xi'an, and they're redistributed to the interior major cities instead of having them go by sea all the way around Indian Ocean, South China Sea, and enter China, uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, or Shenzhen, you know, the major coastal ports, and then be trucked again uh, to the interior cities. And this is an example of the low end a consumer product, right? You have obviously from Europe, the red wine, cheese, milk, milk powder, uh, meats, and on the right, you have a lower right, you have the agricultural products. These are from Kazakhstan and the green peas from Uzbekistan, right? So the trains, the middle section of the China-Europe trains also now connect to more of the agricultural production basis of Central Asia and they're trucks to the uh, railroad stations and being able to, uh, to go back to China to help fill up some of the empty uh, trains that started out. And again, just a couple last slides to, uh, to illustrate, to finish the empirical part um, of the presentation of this book. And of course, you have also Duisburg, right? This is the city that set up a sister city relationship with Wuhan in 1982, quite early in China's opening. And then you have a street, uh, uh, Wuhan Strauss here. And then obviously Duisburg's important location globally, but in Europe, right? It's not just the largest inland uh, port, but the junction between the Rhine and the Jura, but also it has other facilities that you can ship along the river. But this is the lower left is the port where the container boxes can go onto the, uh, the trains and the trucks uh, onto the Autobahn. Uh, to other parts of Europe. So, so Duisburg is secondary, smaller, deindustrialized city in Europe has experienced a revival as a result becoming the most important hub for receiving the trains from China and redistributing uh, the products uh, to Europe. So it helps the unemployment rate. It obviously has also brought in uh, real estate investment from China and the influence has also penetrated the schools where Mandarin instruction and now has becoming more popular. And again, so I want to finish with um, from the European side of the, um, the transcontinental network. So Europe has its own new Silk Road initiative, the Trans-European Transport Network, the so-called 10-T, 
is also uh, gearing up, you know, to upgrade the railroads, the roads, airports, and so on. So it's interesting to see. I haven't done research on, on the European side that much, but it's interesting to see whether the China Europe train trains are coming into Europe how it may connect to the other corridor developments, right? Mostly are related to the trains. For example, you know, you have the Xi'an to Verona, which is also near Venice and Milan train, right? And this is the destination at the bottom uh, with the arrow is pointing. And you can see, and then there's also this new planned corridor upgrading of the European, under the European 10-D project. And of course, here, when the train comes through Belarus, Minsk, and into Warsaw, and then there's a project between Warsaw, obviously, to Tallinn, connection to the ports and along the, uh, on the Baltic Sea. Okay? And this is another line that has a connection to Scandinavian. This is back to where you are. And you can see that it comes into the Central Europe and going down to South, but also North. In a couple of examples of uh, the trains between Finland, Povola, the city Povola, and Xi'an, which ships a lot of very good lumber uh, from, from uh, Finland and to Xi'an on the lower left. And this is a train in uh, leaving from Navik in Norway, carrying salmon, you know, to the border between Switzerland and, and Finland. Uh, and trans uh, change the tracks, you know, to uh, uh, from the standard gauge to the to the wider gauge, which is used in Finland, and go through Russia, Kazakhstan, and back to to Chicago. So again, it's a it's an example of the rising demand for European consumer products, food, uh, uh, so on, uh, that can take advantage of the growing number of the companies. Uh, Sino Europe logistic companies that are getting involved in shipping. So, my final chart, getting back to the theme that Colonel referred to at the beginning, regional. What I have identified here between China and Europe is really five regional groupings of countries, right, that cover all the geographic territories in the form of the nation states. Yet, what you see here. It's a very heavy and prominent presence of China in all of five of these regional groupings. All the countries that are italicized are countries where China's freight train can reach now, obviously to different cities, right? But these are the countries. So if you count them up, it's a vast majority of the countries that are part of the five regional groupings of some countries like Kazakhstan, obviously appear twice in the SCO and the EAU, but then you have also countries at the bottom. Uh, we see the European Union, obviously UK is now out, but then if you look at the train connections, right, you have five, four countries that are red. These are inland, lock, inland landlocked European countries, but they are all reachable uh, by the train uh, through other countries. Last example to finish, and then even for UK, that's no longer officially out of the, of the EU, now has a very direct long distance connection to the small merchandise center of EU. You have two very different global cities, right? On the left in Europe, you have top global financial center with New York, on the right, on the east, you have the world's largest small merchandise distribution and sourcing center. So it allows a lot of different kinds of different levels of trade happening uh, between these two cities. So I think with that, uh, I will stop. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Well, um Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Chen. Um, congratulations again on your wonderful publication. It's indeed a very time, timely one. Um, and as you saw to us, there are a lot of uh, um, um, different dynamics and movements happen on the ground. And indeed, we need 
uh, uh, new theoretical imaginations to capture those dynamics and the nature of those new special patterns. It's also interesting to see how Belt and Road Initiative uh, contribute to the flourishing of new communities, new corridors, new regional clusters. I'm sure we can come back to that um, in the uh, discussion. Um, I think Belt and Road Initiative um, it has other dimensions, important dimensions to address and they are entangled with each other. So uh, let's now um, have the words from Professor Jon Delman, uh, who has been monitoring uh, the uh, green cooperation along the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, Jon, uh, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I will discuss uh, the Green Belt and Road Initiative, uh, whether it's green enough. Um, so um, I think, of course, it's connected to what we've just heard, but it's connected to so much more, the entire Chinese investment program and program of collaboration around the world. So these are the talking points. I don't want to go through them. You can just briefly read them. Okay, so how, how, do the, how, how does the BRI link up with the green uh, dimensions? So I think uh, we've seen a pushback against the BRI uh, starting in 2017 and 18. And environmental concerns have been uh, one, of, one of the major issues uh, relating to the Chinese projects and investments uh, around the world. So a lot of politicians, civil society, media representatives have, have been asking questions about the environmental impact of the BRI. There have also been questions about the conditions of financing, uh, about the debt risk, whether it's sustainable, uh, the labor conditions. Uh, there have been uh, doubts about the BRI's long-term survivability uh, altogether. And maybe there has been um, a couple of years where we haven't seen a lot of debate inside China uh, about the BRI, but this changed um, in 2019 when uh, Xi Jinping recognized the issues in the Belt and Road Initiative and the criticisms from the partners and the public uh, around the world. So out of this second Belt and Road Forum, uh, leaders communicate, emphasize the need to, uh, to, to reiterate the green dimensions of the Belt and Road. So they said such cooperation will be open, green and clean. We embrace open economy and inclusive non-discriminatory global market. All interested countries are welcome to join in such cooperation. And we underline the importance of promoting green development and addressing the challenges of environmental protection and climate change, including by en enhancing our cooperation to implement the Paris Agreement. We encourage more efforts in building a culture of integrity and combating corruption. So this, this uh, communicate clearly tackled the issues that have been raised uh, in the pre previous years uh, very, very clearly and, and head on. So what has come out of it? First of all, let's look at the, the Belt and Road Initiative commitments. And I'm happy I found this uh, photo of a train going through Central Asia uh, in light of what we've just heard about. Well, the Belt and Road combines uh, different types of commitments uh, from China and of course from the partner co countries and support and uh, collaboration. So you have um, Overseas development assistance, uh, assistance with a lot of public agency support from different Chinese agencies, like we've just heard different provincial governments, for example. We have concessional financing, we have commercial financing, and we have investments by state-owned enterprises and private companies. And it seems the private companies are taking a bigger share of the, of the uh, total uh, uh, investments uh, over the last few years. But I, I, I don't have time to go into this, but I think it's an interesting development. So at the Belt and Road Forum in 2017, the first one, Xi Jinping promised 100 billion US dollars of dedicated uh, Belt and Road Initiative funding. And um, so the Silk Road Fund, a dedicated uh, funding mechanism for Belt and Road would take 14.5%. Uh, it is then um, China Development Bank is 36 point cent, Export Import Bank, and these are the two major finances of Belt and Road Initiative projects. 
would take 19 and official assistance, grant assistance would take up 9.2 and then 43.5% would be loaned from other financial institutions. In fact, this compares very well to what other major countries do in their international engagement. And of course, uh, China sought uh, matching external collaboration and funding uh, for, for the initiatives under the, the Belt and Road. So if we look at, at these figures from 2018, you can see that the two policy banks, the, the China Development Bank and Exim Bank of China actually funds uh, almost half of all projects and other state-owned commercial, commercial banks uh, about 36%. Silk Road Fund is still a minor financing uh, uh, institution. Then you have multilateral financial institutions. They are also minor. Uh, you have bonds, you have uh, equity financing, uh, taking about 10%. And then uh, Chinese government sponsored bilateral uh, funds uh, that take up 2%. So you could say the major portion of the financing of the Belt and Road come from these uh, state-owned banks. So, as we saw before, China is, 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 is trying to mainstream Belt and Road through all its international uh, development and relations uh, platforms and instruments. So China has just issued a new international development cooperation strategy uh, for the new area. era. And, and those who know China will know this is uh, Xi Jinping's concept for the next um, decades. So China wishes to offer more public goods to the international community and join forces with other countries to build a better common future. So this is what we've been hearing from Xi Jinping for quite a long time. Now it's stated officially that in China's ODA, the Belt and Road Corporation is a major platform. Uh, so it's not on its way down. And China wants to help other developing countries pursue the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is a key goal for China. So these are important statements. So China, when it comes to these dimensions, China aims to assist through its aid other developing countries in promoting new energy, protecting the environment, addressing climate change. So developing clean energy, protecting biodiversity, addressing climate change, curbing desertification, and conserving marine and forest resources. So all of these issues are, are articulated in China's international development strategy, which is good. Of course, it also commits in a way China to pursue these uh, efforts. However, out of the 423 turnkey aid projects from, that are registered in this new uh, strategy, uh, when it looks back at what has happened to the, from 2012 to, to 18, 13 of these only were climate change programs. So wind and solar energy, biogas, small hydropower. So it's not a big share. It's actually a very small share of these turnkey A projects. You know these projects like they are roads, they are stadiums, they are major, major cultural venues and, and things like this. So this dimension is still quite uh, insignificant. In order to ramp up, um, the intentions. The Chinese government is looking at and at the, how to develop a green governance framework. So from a theoretical perspective, governance implies uh, collective solutions to problems that involve multiple public and private actors and are too complex to be addressed by individuals, groups of individuals, non-state or state actors on their own. So there has to be a collaboration. Governance comprises public and private organizations, regimes and other forms of norms, principles, regulations, and decision-making procedures. So coming together as a, a governance architecture, as it's called. So governance architectures combine hard legal frameworks with soft law, that is voluntary agreements and arrangements. So you could say this is the kind of arrangements that the Chinese government, government are, is pursuing in, uh, in its efforts to, to find the framework for implementing uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative in a more coordinated manner. So for the green dimensions, there are some basic documents that uh, were elaborated in 2017. One is called the Belt and Road Ecological Environmental Cooperation Plan. And the, the other one is called the Guidance on Promoting uh, Green Belt and Road. So these are sort of framework documents. Those who know China will know they are very broad. Uh, they have a lot of, 
of uh, declared intentions, but they're not very operational. So you could say the basic principles are that uh, China is looking for broad frameworks together with its partners and the application of soft law. Uh, but they are, these frameworks are get gradually to be complemented, complemented by other guidelines. And there's a wish to define standards for green, uh, green development, and mainstreaming of green across all platforms and actors within the Belt and Road Initiative. And of course, this is promising. And there also has to be a respect for local frameworks. And in a minute, we'll also see what are the consequences of this. And then building a platform through international collaboration. And finally, accomplish uh, the SDGs by 2030. China has signed to them and is, uh, is an active participant around the world in, in uh, pursuing them. So, the organizational framework of the Belt and Road Initiative is to use existing China-driven organization, use existing multilateral organizations, seek cooperation with the UN organizations that are relevant, uh, and create new dedicated Belt and Road Initiative organizations. So when we have the dedicated uh, Belt and Road institutions, um, we have um, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Let's say the decision-making body is called the Belt and Road Forum. We have a Silk Road Fund, a financing instrument. We have two commercial arbitration courts, one in Xi'an, uh, where we just heard of, uh, heard of as a hub for, for export and import uh, from and into China. And China wants to, uh, to um, refer cases that relate to conflicts over Belt and Road uh, initiative projects to these two arbitration courts. Uh, and they're built on international principles and have international judges. There's the Global Blue Econom Economy Partnership Forum that covers collaboration across the oceans. And then for the, the green dimensions, we have Belt and Road Initiative Ecological or Green Coalition, which was initially established with UNEP under the UN. And China also wants to link the Belt and Road to existing organizations. Here I can just give one example, FOCAC, Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, a long-standing collaboration between China and African countries. It's now more and more uh, drawn into uh, the Belt and Road Initiative framework. And here we have a photo from the second Belt and Road Forum in Beijing, where you see the uh, heads of state and prime ministers from around the world, um, mainly from developing countries. So the Green Development Co Coalition, uh, which ha it has a secretariat, uh, but it also has a center that is uh, doing research and gathering data, um, now comprises 130 organizations from around the world. And it's, it's a voluntary arrangement. You can join, you can participate in what you want to, uh, and you can also withdraw if you want to. They have established 10 international thematic partnerships on biodiversity and ecosystem management, green energy and energy efficiency, green finance and investments, improvement of environmental quality in green cities, South-South environmental cooperation and, and SDG capacity building, green technology innovation, corporate social responsibility, sustainable transportation, uh, which refers to what we just heard about, climate change governance and green transformation, environmental legislation and standards, maritime community with a shared future and marine environmental governance. And all of these thematic partnerships are operational now and they entail a, a leadership that comprises a Chinese organization or more organizations and one or more international organizations. And they're driving the agendas. And uh, this coalition is hosted by China's Minister of Ecology and Environment. So it's, it's, it's anchored pretty much in the right place in the Chinese uh, uh, party state set up. So the Green Coalition has set up an advisory function that is focusing on project sustainability. I think this is important for all the criticisms we heard about before. So they have, they have um, written a long report that is based on international principles for, for uh, assessment of, uh, of projects uh, in considering uh, sustainability issues, environmental impact, social impact, and all of this. And their main recommendation is to apply differentiated management to projects depending on the environmental impact, uh, which is an essential part of green investment principles and transition investments in, advocated by NGOs that work in this sector. So they are proposing 
a guide talk, that talks about red projects uh, that are basically projects that would be put on a negative list because the cost of uh, mitigating the environmental impact is too high for, for uh, from, from any uh, perspective. Yellow projects have a moderate impact. Um, they do no significant harm to any environmental aspect and any residual environmental harm can be mitigated by the project itself through affordable and effective measures within reasonable boundaries. And then we have green projects that are projects that are encouraged or what you would call the positive list. Um, so this report has been submitted to, uh, to the Belt and Road Forum, to the Chinese authorities. The question is, of course, to what extent will it be used? It is, after all, only an advisory. So the other green uh, Belt and Road initiatives, there's a Belt and Road Green Cooling Initiative that was launched by National Development Reform Commission and several United Nations agencies and the American uh, Energy Foundation. And the initiative will um, promote deployment of energy efficient technologies in the cooling and air conditioning industries with policy dialogues, information exchange and capacity building programs. There's a Belt and Road Green Lightning Initiative basically formed on the same background. And then there's a BRI environmental big data platform that will provide information on environmental laws, regulations, standards, policies, and technologies in Belt and Road countries. Its five sub-platforms include the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's environmental information sharing platform. So this, this also indicates that even the Shanghai Cooperation Organization organization that was conceived as a security organization is now working on, on, on green issues, you could say. And there's a Belt and Road Energy Partnership that was announced at the second Belt and Road Forum in Beijing in April 2019 that is still under formation. These initiatives work to some extent, so you could say that there is a kind of government framework uh, developing around the Belt and Road Initiative as uh, green dimensions. And the idea is, as I said, to adapt to local conditions. And this is a map that shows the Belt and Road uh, the countries that participate in the Belt and Road and wh where they are on this uh, International Environmental Performance Index. This is a complex index, of course, and you can see there are different gradings for this. And the highest here is between 64 and 81. You'll find them here, for example, in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, China is in, so in the middle. Uh, and many, so many countries are, have a, are at a lower range here. But there are also countries at a, at a higher range that are engaged uh, with the Belt and Road Initiative. Not all of them necessarily engaged with uh, the Green Coalition. But the fact of the matter is that we know from a lot of research that, that dealing with local conditions or adapting to local conditions means for the Chinese actors that actually if they comply with local environmental standards, uh, they are safe. So the question is, uh, will the BRI contribute to actually in enhancing the position of these countries and even China itself uh, on, on an index like this, that is to enhance its uh, in, in environmental performance? I think that's a basic question that we have to ask. So green financing under the BRI, Chinese banks are on the way with an environmental and sustainability analysis instruments and procedures. So the China Development Bank has applied a review process to sort environmental impacts of projects into four categories according to national and if applicable regional policies. So environmentally friendly, compliant, requiring rectification and high risk. So they have started working with these categories and, and, and actually uh, make uh, decisions on, in, on uh, investments on the basis of this. We don't know to what extent though. China Exim Bank has established the pro-environment system with four no's, mostly focused on the client's performance. It also stipulates compliance with local laws and internal regulations. And 27 financial institutions from around the world have adopted the green investment principles for the Belt and Road development, first re released in December 2018. They include also the, the major Chinese uh, state-owned banks that are financing the Belt and Road. We do not know, however, to what extent they are being followed. So when we look at the business involvement in the BRI, of course, they are responsible for implementing projects and therefore for implementing the green dimension on the ground. And if we look at, um, 
at, at the, the businesses that go out, certainly Belt and Road Initiative is supporting big business uh, from China going out into the world, investing in the world. This is the top uh, contractors um, in, in the world. And four of these are 10 top contractors in construction, are all Chinese. So you have China State Construction Engineering Corporation, China Railway Group, uh, China Railway Construction Corporation, China Communication Construction Company is the four first ones. And you see all of them are, are uh, getting bigger in, in, uh, in, uh, as in international investors. So the international footprint is going up. It's only Shanghai Construction Group that is going down. So if you want to enforce the green dimension, you have to focus on these businesses to make sure that they actually comply with these green investment principles. So in recent years, we have seen BRI investments um, going down. This is a comparison over investments within the first six months of each year. You can see the two major sectors have clearly been energy and transport. But you see generally the picture is that investments are going down 2019 to 20. So even before the, co the Corona crisis. So clearly there was a boom here uh, at, the, at the mid of the, the decade and, not, and it's going down now for many different reasons. One of the reasons I, 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 I assume from reading uh, the literature is that there's also been a stronger focus on, on compliance with, uh, with uh, environmental uh, criteria and principles in investments. There's also a shortage of capital, that's another issue. If we look at construction, uh, the construction sector, this, this figure shows China's outward investment um, from 2000 to five to 2018 in cumulative terms. And you, you see that most of China's overseas investment in construction went to the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is a major sector within the, uh, uh, within the Belt and Road. Therefore, it's very important to focus on, on. On the other hand, energy is important and China does export dirty technologies and CO2 emissions. Study by the Global Environmental Institute found the Chinese involvement in more than 100 coal-fired power plants in planning on the construction in building road countries as of May 2017. And we have to um, we have to remind ourselves that the statistics on the building road are really really difficult to get to. So these are, are different views on on how we can look at these issues. Boston University's Global Development Policy Center identified investments in coal. Uh, between 2018. Um, American Enterprise Institute, they have a China Global Investment Tracker identified 23.5 billion of coal investments and 36.5 billion of coal contracts by Chinese entities abroad between 2014 and 2019. And here often statistics mix dispersed funds with, with uh, intended investments. And of course, this is something we have to, uh, to bear in mind also. The Chinese are not very transparent about these figures. From 2014 to 17, 93% of the Silk Road Fund's energy sector investments were in fossil fuel projects, including a coal fired power plant in uh, United Arab Emirates and natural gas power plant in Egypt. And one study found that foreign power plants supported by Chinese financial institutions between 2001 and 16 release, will release almost 600 million tons of CO2 per year. Uh, that is more CO2 than all but seven countries in the world, and that if these plants operate for 30 years on average, lifetime CO2 emissions from the plants would be almost 18 gigatons. That is roughly half of global emissions in 2017. So in a way, China is now exporting its, uh, its uh, emissions. And this, this is critical, and this, China has been criticized for this, and I think the, the reactions we saw in 2019 at the second Belt and Road Forum was also a response to these criticisms. However, what we also see is that renewable energy is taking over from fossils in, in energy investments in recent years. So the dark blue is renewable energy, uh, the, the medium blue here is fossil fuels and, and the light blue is unknown. Uh, so you can see from having been uh, represented the majority of the investments uh, uh, fossil fuels are now being uh, taken over by, maybe eventually replaced by, by uh, renewable energy investments. So that's a good sign. So 
there's been, as I said, a lot of criticism. And on the ground, as, as Tunong said, that what, what happens there? Well, in, in Kenya, we have a, one, a, a very well-known project, a prestige project called the Lamu Coal Power Plant. It's located here in Kenya, and it's part of a huge complex of infrastructure, roads, rail, railway links, uh, uh, urban development, and so on and so forth uh, uh, in, in this area. So it was going to produce uh, 1,050 megawatt um, uh, based on coal power, and uh, it's 20 kilometers from Lamos Islands and the historic old town, which is on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. So not a very, very good uh, location for this type of uh, project. The project sponsor is actually a local power company. It's not a Chinese or a Chinese company. But of course, the technology is delivered, the financing is delivered by, by Chinese uh, actors. And it's expected to cost the US uh, dollars 2 billion and was initially planned to be operational this year. However, civil society struck back and, uh, and there's been a lot of, a lot of wriggling about uh, this project, uh, uh, demonstrations, uh, protests, uh, court cases, and uh, this year, the industrial and sorry, last year, Industrial Commercial Bank of China, that was one of the major finances of the project, has decided not to finance the Lamu Coal Plan due to cited environmental and social risk with the project. And I think this is uh, a situation that shows that the Chinese uh, actors are really are trying to be responsive to local demands, local needs, but also local uh, criticism. And this project was not a Chinese idea. It came from, from the Kenyan side, but the Chinese partners got, uh, got entangled with this uh, um, fight between local civil society and the, and the local authorities who wanted this uh, project. I wanted to talk about financial sustainability, but I, I don't think I have the time. We need to have some discussion, but I think the, the results of different studies, different pr uh, procedures of these studies is that China is not actively pursuing uh, debt trap uh, diplomacy. China is very much responding to local demands. Uh, and therefore, this uh, study, I can quote this, uh, that has had a focus on Malaysia, but also on Sri Lanka said that Malaysia has been betrayed as both a victim of China's debt trap diplomacy and is leading a backlash against the Belt and Road Initiative. Neither of these narratives are accurate. Malaysia's engagement with the BRI actually demonstrates how recipients seek to harness Chinese economic expansion to serve their own domestic agendas. And I think generally we could say that this is the case. China does respond to local demands rather than pushing uh, Chinese projects onto uh, weak local partners. There may be an exception in the resource extraction sector where China really needs resources, but otherwise I think uh, it, it is very important that when we look at the financial sustainability of, uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative, China seems to be sensitive to local, local criticism, local queries, and, and local wishes, rather than just pushing uh, ahead with uh, because it's a, it's a major power. So how do we assess the green dimensions? Well, the BRI sustainability sustainability issues are coming to the forefront of BRI investment practices, but still in the early stage when it comes to practice. So there's a gradualist approach, which is well known in China. Chinese government is seeking international best practice advice on these issues, for example, through the Green Coalition. Chinese actors are exploring and experimenting with internationally recognized principles and practices, and the Chinese side is pushing to establish a coherent governance framework. The scene is still fragmented, however. There's no central overview or coordination of green dimensions. And the Chinese actors are mostly going by their own policies, practices adapted to the local situation. You could say the literature tells us there's a pragmatic bottom line focus. They are, after all, they are for profit. So the challenge is, is that the BRI, and this is the last slide, the BRI specific and BRI related policies are not stringent, but based on voluntary and co uh, uh, and corporate self-regulatory instruments. Telecoupling and interdependency means that human environmental systems in one place affect similar systems in other places. For example, fossil fuels investments expose Chinese emissions, but it still affects China because it's a global, it's a global impact. Strong national discourse uh, in China 
but there has been weak enforcement of the green dimensions up to now. Therefore, there's still a long way to go for the Belt and Road Initiative, initiative to become sustainable and green. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jan. Um, it's a great conclusion that the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is a long march. Um, uh, thank you for your rich analysis, uh, equally fascinating. It remains uh, highly interesting to see how uh, China's green aspirations are reflected, are articulated um, in the Belt and Road Initiative projects. And you asked very important questions on the government, uh, governance capacity. Uh, we may wonder how government, uh, uh, governance quality including the risk uh, management capacity can be enhanced in order to um, secure the quality of and, and sustainability of the BII uh, projects. Now let's turn to, time is running, uh, let's turn to uh, Hans for um, well, how many minutes uh, would you like? To, maybe three minutes um, uh, we can allocate to you for some cool comments, sparks uh, from the North. And hopefully we can still have um, five to 10 minutes for open discussions. Hans? All right. Uh, thank you uh, for Don and uh, Niaz and uh, Macargo and, and Liu Churong. And of course, uh, especially Professor Chen and Professor Delman for giving fantastically informative uh, presentations. A bit uh, overwhelming in terms of uh, information. And I got to say a bit painful even to listen to or to, to at least watch a lot of maps and a lot of trains and a lot of directions at a time when all of us are stuck, not able to travel or take the train uh, and looking much forward to visiting you uh, wherever you are. I'll be very short. Um, I've been asked to uh, give a few uh, comments on the so-called Nordic uh, perspective and then ask a few questions. And I think uh, uh, Jurgen, who's obviously also speaking with a Nordic voice has also raised a lot of those general concerns that uh, are normally seen from kind of a Nordic view. I think in the early days when the Belt and Road Initiative was first came, come to known and uh, myself and others from the Nordic countries were asked to participate in different Belt and Road activities, uh, lots of us were pointing out to most of the maps or all of the maps that were out on Belt and Road those days that the Nordic countries were hardly ever included. There were kind of gray, gray zones in the, in the maps of where the belts and roads uh, were heading. And that has, of course, changed in the last few years where we even have a, a northern road or a silk, uh, ro silk um, belt and road uh, uh, going upwards uh, towards uh, Russia and through some of the territories that connect also us with Norway. Uh, Jurgen has pointed to some of the issues that are normally raised from the Nordic perspective, and that goes with a lot of the, the standards and the quality issues that are often uh, discussed. It also comes fr from a lot of European countries, especially in the, not in the Nordic countries, but Eastern Europe, that are looking for investments and in so-called fresh money, and not only big loans and credit packages that are to be uh, paid back. And also, I think you see from all the Nordic countries on the political side that there's lots of enthusiasm for the connectivity and for fulfilling infrastructure needs, but a strong reluctance to embrace the Belt and Road, so forth, politically, but more willingness to engage in other activities, for instance, in the Greening Coalition activities, where we also see a kind of interesting dynamic where also China allows countries and actors on both the political and commercial side to engage with the Belt and Road at different levels and with different types of engagements. Uh, but if I was to ask a question, and now you, the moderator, uh, you can decide whether to kind of lump my questions together with all the rest, because I'm sure there will be similar questions as other people are asking. Uh, but um, both of you have, uh, both Professor Chun and uh, uh, Dalman have pointed to very kind of vast stretches and also uh, Delman pointed to lots of financial kind of aspects of the Belt and Road projects. And we know there's several different Chinese institutions involved. We know there are quite a bit of multilateral institutions uh, involved. But what I'm asking, wondering is the local, the domestic investments from all those countries and institutions and banks and commercial actors in all those countries uh, where the belts and roads act, uh, obviously go through. 
And then the second question is, I guess it's both for Professor Delman and Professor Chun, is all this kind of issue around standards. And standards, of course, is, a, is both a technical question, but it's also a quality question. Uh, and in the banking world, one often talks about safeguards and type of quality measures for uh, how projects are conducted. And as um, more discussion and kind of more attention towards standards, a way forward to also for China maybe to appease some of the criticism, or is that all the bickering about standards more of a bickering point from countries that want to criticize um, criticize the Belt and Road and more or less kind of beside the points. Then I give the floor back to you, uh, Chun Rong, and all the the people signed up for the this uh, webinar who I'm. I'm sure also wanting to pose a few questions. But thank you, extremely uh, informative from, uh, from all of you, both of you. Um, yeah, thank you, Hans. I, I, like you, I also have a lot of curiosities, but, but before we collect uh, questions from audience, I, I think we still have some minutes. Um, shall we give one minute to each of uh, the speakers to respond to Hans uh, briefly? Sorry for being a bit mean about this. Um, um, Professor Chen, uh, what would you say? Yeah, I like the question uh, about the standards um, in, in a more theoretical part of, uh, of chapter two, where I um, maybe boldly, controversially raise the question whether China is beginning to drive a new phase of globalization by not only making things, building things, connecting things, but setting the norms and standards, right? So that's the big question. I think in the context of the China, your prey train, you have inherent challenges uh, facing uh, uh, standards, harmonization across so many borders, not only because of the technical issue of uh, uh, adjusting, changing uh, gates, but also, um, you know, changing, building different kind of containers, adjusting different temperatures, and uh, adjusting wheels, uh, adjusting, you know, other kinds of border clearing, custom reporting, documentation, e-commerce. So there's a lot of uh, uh, remaining challenges to uh, uh, raise the efficiency of the border crossing by adjusting and harmonizing the standards, the safety and uh, of the uh, contain, uh, containerized goods. Uh, and that remains to be seen and how quickly and how easily, you know, the participating countries and companies, you know, be willing to make concessions in working with China uh, to uh, bring the standards into a more uh, internationalized uh, ways of doing this business. Um, I think on, on my side, uh, with regard to the local investments, it differs. Uh, where are we? Are we in the least developed countries? Uh, are we in highly indebted countries or are we in middle income countries? So it differs. The Chinese practices differ. But I, I think from the perspective of the green dimensions, clearly China has to learn from international experience because it's not been a strong uh, competence of Chinese banks to be to engage with, uh, with uh, these types of assessments of, of investments, uh, proposals and business projects in, in the past. So it's, it's, an uphill, uh, it's an uphill learning curve for them. But what I wanted to emphasize is that I think it's, um, it's, actually, um, it's actually being uh, studied, it's being uh, taken into, uh, as you say, the safeguarding procedures uh, for, of the banks uh, when, when they assess projects. And, and therefore we also see, I think this could explain some of the slowing down of investments, not all, all of it. With regard to local investments, there's been a lot of criticism of China uh, in relation to, the, to uh, debt trap diplomacy that China is taking local uh, assets as collateral, but often that's not the case. It's, 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 it's only in a minority uh, in a number of minority cases, it has happened. So we know that the oil for, for loan uh, um, arrangements uh, from, from the past, and in a way, China is trying to pursue similar arrangements, uh, looking at what can countries con offer to China that is in demand in the Chinese market, and then making agreements that if, the, if uh, there has to be 
a payment through a good export of goods, uh, that uh, this will, will help local exporters find access to the Chinese markets. And uh, basically, I think these contracts are the only place in the Belt and Road Initiative where you have hard law. So, and uh, so non-compliance leads to sanctions. And, um, and uh, the question is, how do you handle these sanctions? And I think uh, the commercial operators from the Chinese side are very, very clear. They take people to court, for example. But the Chinese government is behind them and they try to help mitigate this kind of crisis. Um, so I think we need a more nuanced view on what is happening on the ground. But we have to recognize that, of course, a lot, most of these projects are financed through credits and they have to be paid back. And therefore, Great. the better these projects are prepared, um, the, the more likely it is that they will turn into sustainable projects. Okay, there are, um, thank you. Um, there are a lot of questions, I, I, I'm afraid, and I'm sorry that uh, we cannot cover all of them. Uh, I think, uh, uh, let me uh, pick up um, uh, three to four questions as a group, and uh, maybe each of you could uh, uh, share your feedback and, and, and insights um, in two to three minutes. So, um, one of the questions is about um, climate change. We are climate change, let me read it. Uh, we are climate change, global warming um, um, obstructs the development of population, agriculture and manufacturing centers along the Belt of Roads. Uh, I, I think fascinating issues and how climate change will shape the spatial um, uh, ties um, in BRI projects. And second one is, how are we to understand the kind of power China exercise through the uh, 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 BRI in such influence expansionist behavior, mainly soft, or might uh, there be a hard or sharp elements? So um, I think this is a very um, a question with a strong political science um, flavor and, and how um, uh, um, different theories of uh, like realism could uh, address on this. Um, another one, um, what are your views on the prospect of the ice uh, Polo Silk Road? Um, um, uh, well, uh, Hans just talked about Nordic perspective and yeah, uh, this is very relevant to Nordic um, uh, concern, right? Uh, is there a Nord um, common voices of Nordic countries on, on, on on Nordic, um, uh, on the Arctic cooperation, how how interconnectivity will take shape in this region? And let me read two more, and then uh, each one of you, including Hans, could uh, respond. Uh, what is the share of Chinese ownership in the European railway uh, system? And do we see more restrictions when it comes to Chinese investment in European infrastructure? And and I would like to add a bit on that because China EU has just signed a mutual uh, investment agreement. So this treaty, how, how this treaty in, in, um, will impact the um, uh, uh, regional connectivity. Maybe um, Professor Chen would have some updates or thoughts on this. Final question, um, how does the BRI affect Chinese citizens? On what level uh, has it provided to create new jobs and lifting people out of poverty? So uh, uh, excellent questions, the kind of feedback, uh, how, how this project um, um, delivered a kind of developmental impact in, in domestic um, uh, 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 contest. And also, is there any evidence that Ugo labor has been used? Okay. Uh, human rights uh, aspect. Okay, um, um, I would suggest each of you to take uh, two to three minutes um, to address these questions, um, 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 and then we can, uh, yeah, conclude this uh, seminar. Yeah, Professor Chen, would you like to start? All right, I'll take two. So uh, evenly divided, two maybe for the three of us uh, each. And on the, on the real share of railroad ownership, uh, I'm not seeing the uh, most recent uh, clear evidence on whether China have began to acquire any stakes 
in the European uh, railroad companies. Uh, what I've seen so far is a growing uh, multilateral participation of different uh, companies from different countries um, in, in the broader uh, net uh, shipping network. For example, you know, you have uh, the DB in Germany, you know, that, uh, and then the DHL, uh, uh, Nippon Express, you know, the largest uh, logistic companies have now worked with local governments in China like Xi'an. Right, they blocked out particular shipping uh, routes for specialized products, like coming from Korea, Japan, electronics. Right, Nippon Express, you know, would block out the entire train and ship that to Europe. And the European uh, railroad companies, uh, the big ones, the large logistic companies, you know, would obviously have economy of scale. But the smaller logistic companies, you know, would work with local government, both in Europe and in China, to divide up, you know, different containers, you know, for the same train. So you have two ways of shipping it, right? The entire block train versus, you know, the segmented train. So, so it has market opportunities for different companies uh, to participate, working with local government. But I think in the future, it's possible that there could be joint ventures, uh, more you know, focused routes for different companies. And I would say on the citizens' uh, poverty alleviation, the entire turn to the Western region of China, to the interior region of China, I think helps uh, the larger campaign to reduce the regional inequalities, the uneven development, the unbalanced development by creating more investment opportunities more infrastructures, more access of infrastructures to the smaller cities, to the remote regions that are creating economic development opportunities for the people in the lagging, poorer regions of China. So I think that's a good thing, uh, a good connection and beneficial impact. Okay, um, thank you. And Yong? Yes, uh, there was a question about uh, the climate change. How does it affect the spatial uh, shape of spatial arrangements around along the Belt and Road Initiative? I think that's very difficult to say because you have to unbundle climate change into different uh, uh, dimensions. So um, clearly, I've talked about uh, uh, renewable energy as as, uh, as as one of one of the uh, maybe more encouraging uh, developments in recent years. Um, so uh, that you won't have uh, you won't have um, coal-fired power plants. You you won't have to access coal locally. Get it from from somewhere else. It has an impact on climate change. It has an impact on lo the local environment. On the other hand, you also have hydropower as part of renewable energy, which has uh, clearly has some harmful effects. Uh, it's very disputed. There's a lot of civil society resistance to hydropower projects. Uh, so I, I think you'll see very different responses and very different uh, types of uh, spatial arrangements depending on the relationship between the Chinese side, the local government, but also the engagement of civil society in any given uh, project or any given situ situations. Uh, so I guess where you have active civil societies where they allow to influence um, the design and the spatial arrangement, you will see different results than you see in countries where you only have bilateral government to government uh, negotiations about uh, projects. But I haven't seen any effort of programming the Belt and Road Initiative based on climate change considerations per se. So they have to be unbundled. They ha you have to look at them as different dimensions in, in, a, very complex, uh, in a very complex arrangement al along these uh, corridors, uh, but even beyond the corridors because now the Belt and Road Initiative is not only linked to these corridors, it's, it's basically in existence all over the world. Thank you. Great, Hans? Right, so uh, very good questions that, and I would love to go into depth from my knowledge base at least, but um, I'll keep it short. On the railroad ownership issue, I think that's a very interesting question and I, I uh, I don't have a clear answer, but to the who, the person who asked it, I would start looking into 
the projects and the writing around the Budapest um, Belgrade Railroad and look into it from that perspective. And I don't think it's necessarily always so clear what type of investments might lead to types of short or long-term um, responsibilities or, or, um, or uh, possibilities of, of management and so forth. So that's not so clear. On the Arctic issue, um, that's also a big thing that I would like to <laughs> devote much more time to discussing. I think the reactions uh, to the Arctic ice road is, uh, belt road, is, silk road is very mixed. So there's a lot of local enthusiasm in all those countries connected, also in Norway and, and Sweden and Finland about the potential for better connectivity in real physical projects. Then there's a lot more skepticism, not necessarily because of political reasons or political fears, it's because of very different assessments to what's doable, feasible in terms of commercial, insurance, environmental terms. And that's one of my big fascinations with China in all the Arctic region is that it's so optimistic in so many fronts, not necessarily re relating to geopolitics at all, just different types of measuring long and short-term profits and risk assessments. And that you also very much see into the thinking around those belts and roads that might stretch into the Arctic uh, region. And now you, we have seen part of the kind of overall discussions over, all over the world, also in Europe, of course, an in increasing attention to um, um, political or uh, risk related issues also related to China and China related issues. So you also see in the discussions around the ice silk road uh, that the commercial side, the business side is looking into it with very optimistic and positive uh, eyes for, for commercial opportunities while the, the more kind of security related defense or military institutions might look at it with a much more kind of watchful, skeptical eye towards with what intentions those types of activities are. And that's also the, the place we are in internationally, dealing with China and dealing with Europe, that the same type of activities are being considered with very different types of lenses, depending on which environments or backgrounds uh, you come with. And that goes to the third question that I picked up was on this soft and hard power side. So the Belt and Road is obviously beyond any doubt leading to increased capacities for China on both kind of hard power types of tools, but definitely also in types of soft power tools. So it's not either or, it's, it's, um, it's all over. Thank you. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I agree that uh, um, I do think that uh, some region specific conditions uh, will uh, shape the um, um, spatial connectivity on the Belt Road initiatives and Nordic countries and the Arctic has very um, exceptional um, 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 features. So um, it would be very promising to, um, to promote some further discussions about comparative uh, connectivity uh, 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 research. Um, so um, I think that's an excellent um, 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 uh, examination. Um, um, well, time is flying. I'm sorry, it take a little bit longer than expected. And, um, um, and, and sorry uh, to the audience that we cannot um, cover all the uh, questions. And, uh, uh, but I really appreciate a lot of interesting uh, remarks and also comments. Um, maybe we can do another event um, and, and, and specify the discussions uh, together with you. Um, and uh, I don't think we, uh, there are uh, easy and neat answers to um, uh, questions of great complexity like BRI. But uh, as uh, our panelists, panelists has demonstrated to us, um, there is always a need for solid research-based debate, and there is always a need for greater theoretical imagination. So I can only admire all of you for being able to read China and the world, uh, both inside out and outside in, top down and bottom up. Um, thank you for highly inspirational conversation. So. Um,
On behalf of the Fudan Center and uh, our co-organizers, Nupi, Nias, Think China, and Fudan Development Institute, I uh, thank you all again um, for the terrific, uh, for the um, uh, interesting and uh, inspirational discussions. Um, yeah, please stay well and stay connected. Hope to see you again soon in our next meeting of minds. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.